Now, uh, throughout the conference, throughout the conference, um, I'm going to be like Drew Carey and just call on people in the audience, not to speak, but I just want to raise up your goodness. So I'd like to raise up Beth Dolderzeke, who's had a, a long career at Viterbo. She retires this week as our Director of Career Services, where for the past decade, we've had over a 99% placement rate in major, in large part due to her great work. Beth, thank you so very much. Um, right down here is J. Peter Petersley, who for 25 years has been reading to children in the Crescent Public Library, and then when pandemic hit, went on Zoom. A boomer who became a Zoomer reading to children. <laughs> J. Peter, thank you. So this will be a goodness report. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a gossip. Be careful around me. You know, Michael pointed out I listen carefully. I'm not a peeping Tom, I'm a listening Tom. And I'm always listening on people's conversations and want to have the importance of raising up, raising up good people. Uh, the word gossip, by the way, comes from two Anglo-Saxon words, God and sibling. It's God talk about our brothers and sisters. Do it well, you build the community up. Do it terribly, you tear the community apart. How important it is that we pay attention to goodness. We pay attention to what works. We recognize those people who serve us each and every day. Our panelists will be speaking about leading through disruption. All of us have experienced disruption, not just these last three years, but for many of us, the longer you live, the more disruption you've experienced. Is that not true? We've all had rough patches. And Thomas Friedman, in his marvelous book called Thank You for Being Late, writes this, we all must learn to live in the eye of the hurricane. And then he writes this, the eye of the hurricane moves along with the storm. It draws energy from it while creating a sanctuary of stability inside. It is both dynamic and stable, and so must we be. We can't escape these accelerations and disruptions. We have to dive into them, take advantage of their energy and flows where possible, move with them, use them to learn faster, design smarter, and collaborate deeper, all so we can build our own eyes to anchor and propel ourselves and our families confidently forward. Then he writes, the closest analog for the eye of the hurricane I can think of is a healthy community. When people feel embedded in a the community, they feel they are protected, respected, and connected. And that feeling is more important than ever because when people feel protected, respected, and connected in a healthy community, it generates enormous trust. And when there's more trust in the room, people are much more likely to grow. When people trust each other, they're more adaptable and open to all forms of pluralism. When people trust each other, they think long term. When there's trust in the room, people are more inclined to collaborate, to experiment, to open themselves up to others, new ideas, novel approaches, and to extending the golden rule. They also don't waste energy criticizing every mistake. They feel free to fail and try again, fail again and try again. Collaboration moves at the speed of trust. Each of the leaders you will hear from here this morning on our panel are people who generate trust in the way in which they serve and lead. The first speaker this morning is Jeff Thompson, familiar to many of you as the former CEO of Gunderson. He's written a book, Lead True, which is available for sale here, but more importantly than that, Jeff is a father, a grandfather, a husband, a pediatric intensive care doctor. And when he came to one of my classes, people asked him about the challenges of leadership. And he said, well, they're not that great. We're looking at him and he said, if I make a wrong decision and we lose a million dollars, well, you can always make a million more dollars. But as an intensive care pediatric physician, if I make a mistake, a family loses a child. There's no greater loss than that. A man of moral passion, compassion, and service, Jeff Thompson. I have a timer. You have to put up with me for about 20 minutes or less. 19 minutes and 57 seconds now. Um, is this, uh, this is working just fine. Um, you know, 
old men, they have bad memories. It was only $10,000, I said, not a million that I would lose. <laughs> if I lost a million of your money, I'd... No, nah, I'd still... Kids more important. Um, okay, so I'm going to... I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to talk about what Tom asked, and that is a bit about, about leading through uh, chaos. And, and Michael, uh, in his piece, you know, talked about it is so pivotal to be a leader, and I'm going to try and convince you that it's pivotal to be a leader not just at the top of the heap as the CEO, but it's important to be a leader throughout the organization, whether you're leading a large team of, let me see, zero, somebody said, or 45 or 4,500, it's, it's, there's a lot of similar principles. One of the things that's important, this is from the head of the World Health Organization. It, it connects with what Tom said about the eye of the hurricane. Um, uh, Tedros said, we generally operate between panic and neglect. Think of the number of companies, think of the number of healthcare organ or government or business, think of organizations that kind of don't pay attention to inevitably a disruption that's coming. The disruption's always coming. It's not that we're not going to have more disruption. So you can't, you can't say that. So you say, how do you build a foundation? How do you build a foundation so those people that are trying to work with you to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, how do you build that foundation so when, when it's time to panic, you, you don't, because you don't have to, because you have a team. One of the hardest things, one of the hardest things I do um, in teaching other senior leaders and CEOs is to get close enough to the work so they feel the pressures, they feel the moral imperative of what they're doing, they feel the importance of the frontline workers. They're busy, oh, they gotta have another meeting with a CFO, or they have to do strategy on something. They never get to where the people are really doing the work. And my point to them is, okay, so you have seven brilliant women and men in your C-suite. They're great, they're smart, they know a lot of stuff, they got degrees longer than their name. It's terrific. I'll take my 7,000. If I can inspire my 7,000 or 700 or 70, I'll take them against your seven in the C-suite any day. We'll outcompete, we'll outserve, we'll outlast, we'll outprepare. Inspire the 7,000, you'll always beat the seven in the sweet, sweet, C suite. Here's how you'll do it. Here's how you do it. Now, here's our strategic plan. This dovetails a lot with what Michael said. Notice what we have at the very top of the strategic plan. We used this one page strategic plan for 14 years. For 14 years, the quality, ooh, I'll get out of the way of your picture. You can have these, by the way, as well. Um, the, the, our quality uh, became nationally recognized service, went through the roof in this town of 56 or 8,000 or however many there are. Um, we had 25,000 people a year apply for jobs at Gunderson. We put away more savings in 14 years than we had in 114 years before that and lowered the cost of care by having a purpose that said we're going to serve. We had all that success Outward facing. It's an outward facing strategic plan. It says, no, nah, it doesn't say we're going to get the big, we're going to be the biggest, we're going to make the most money, we're going to kill the competition. We didn't say that at all. We said we're going to improve the health and well being of patients in the community. So when people apply for jobs, you say, uh, do you want to kill the competition or you want to serve the patients in the community? And so you'd find bright women and men, and you say, would you do that? Can you work on this? Can you work on that? Some of them are sitting right there in her chair, who did exactly this building, our people, not to crush people, but to serve the well-being. So you're saying you can't compete? Of course you can compete. We eliminated senior staff bonuses and still had a zillion people standing in line for jobs when we got a job. Look, look at the mission. Uh, Michael talked about excellence distinguish ourselves through excellence, not mediocrity. We say, do you want to come here and get by or do you want to be excellent? Carolyn says, I want to be excellent. Okay, so then she rose up from the very um, beginning jobs to being a very important director in the cancer center. We, our vision was to be good enough we could be nationally recognized. So you give your staff something to hope for. You're not aiming for mediocrity. You say, okay, 
this year, we're going to be 1% better than we were last year. Ooh, get some hats. Nobody cares. We're going to get our margin from 3.1% to 3.2%. People care even less. They don't care. You say, we're going to be so good that the breast center, the bariatric center, the advanced care planning program, the environmental program, we, program after program, are going to be as good as anybody in the country. People get excited about that. They get inspired because they know they are, let me see, serving the purpose. They're accomplishing excellence. How are you going to get treated along the way? You're going to get treated with respect. There's going to be integrity in the organization. We're going to innovate. There's going to be compassion. These are the values. So you start building, you're building a case. Here's where we're going, and here's how we're going to treat each other along the way. It's not an accident. It's intentional. It's completely intentional. You go to your strategies. How are we going to do this? The strategies are all outward facing. Quality for the well-being the, through the eyes of the patient. Service through the patients and the families. A great place to work. It's a passion for caring and improvement. Aiming for excellence. It's compassion. It's improvement. It's aiming for excellence. It's not saying we're the greatest and we're going to crush people. It says we're going to get better. Why are we going to get better? We're going to get better to serve the health and well-being of patients in the communities. So there becomes a momentum going along. Yeah, but what about the money? There's always about money. Healthcare is a big business. It's a big business. We've got to have money. Sure, it is a business. Finances became a tool. I'm going to show you how this fits in a little later. It became a tool. So affordability is what our finance, our financial goal was affordability. What kind of craziness is that? And by the way, it made a lot of sphincters pucker up in the boardroom when I first brought this out. They said, oh my God, he's a doctor. He's going to give away our money. He's, he was probably one of those 60s and 70s long-haired sandal wearing. Might be true. Probably was true. But... Um, our finances were the best in those 14 years they had been in the history of the organization. But not because it was the goal. It was a tool. Just a tool. It was a tool to serve. Growth. A tool to serve. Best growth we ever had, but it was just a tool. Not intentionally to get bigger and crush somebody. It was just, it was just a tool. Now, it isn't always easy. I'm not saying this is easy. This is very, very hard. You say, wow, that looks, that looks great. It's 14 years it took us to do all that. It's not around. And there's a lot of pressures. I, I was out at Aspen recently. Deborah, Dr. Deborah Bricks, you've all seen her on TV. She's part of the uh, COVID response team. She's a doctor. And, and the interviewer said, so, Dr. Bricks, you're part of the Trump administration. She says, I was not. He says, yeah, but you were. I saw you on TV. He says, of course I served during that, but I served during Obama and Bush, and Clinton. I am a civil servant. I serve the government of the United States, regardless of who the president is. I said, but sometimes you seem to agree with them, sometimes you didn't. She says, people are complex. Situations are complex. Tiny little 12-second word boxes don't explain the complexity of a government, or a pandemic, or delivering care from the government to the people during a pandemic. <clears throat> the reason I put this up there, I had a, 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 she had a great talk, and I had a chance to chat with her uh, for a while. She is, first of all, a civil servant. Leave the politics out of it. Even leave the science out of it. She's a civil servant. She, her job was to serve. Her job was to serve. Now, it's not easy. It sometimes gets really messy. Other people just quit and left. She said, I'm going to stay and try and make it better. Everybody, own values, own decisions, you figure that out. But her goal, her goal was to serve. Lots of labels, lots of struggles. But her goal was to serve. So I'm not saying this is all easy. It is not uh, easy. But here's some guidelines. Uh, Nichols wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review. You as a leader, here's, so here's something to remember. It's messy. We talked about that. You want to prepare ahead of time, build a culture. So we build a culture. It's going to be messy. We understand that. You have to balance speed versus precision. Sometimes it's, you feel good, make a decision, move on, make it. Sometimes, sometimes you have to be more accurate than that. You just can't get it done. You have to engage all the staff 
Amplify your wins. Engaging all the staff, that's my seven or 7,000, right? Your C-suite against my 7,000, I'm gonna win. I'm gonna win, I'm gonna deliver better care. I'm gonna engage the community better. It just, I just, it's just gonna be easier. Amplifying the wins has to do with not making it all about you, the leader or the leader group, or even your organization. A servant organization to the community helps the community win, rises the group. So amplifying wins is a ever-widening circle. It's an ever-widening uh, circle that we can't, we, we can't ignore. Now, you might say, well, this all sounds good, it sounds healthcare. Here is, Here's an article out of a lean organization. Lean, lean is um, the Toyota production system. It's all about manufacturing and all these kinds of things. They have all these tools, and you've heard about them being, you know, tight on money and things. When you look at the data from well-run, lean-based organizations, if you just use the tools, you get some gain. And if you organize the tools across a system and measure and improve, you get more gains. But if you want to be a great organization, you are a principled driven organization. So this is this, is this manufacturing thing says about principles. Yeah, the principles are about trusting, teaching, and engaging the frontline staff, believing that they can help you solve problems, rising continuous improvement up to serve the greater good. Does it help the organization? Of course, but it helps who you serve as well. So it's, so it's principle. So this is mechanical manufacturing international business. They say the end of the line is not a good system. It's a principle driven organization because when the systems need to change, it changes systems because they're not serving the principles. It's the principles that win, that win the day. Let's look at uh, an another one of uh, Thomas's favorite authors, uh, uh, David Brooks, and another person named Dubois. They were at, uh, at a conference in, in, um, in Oxford. <clears throat> the proceedings were published. If you take a group of people and you say, Here's where we're going. Here's the level of excellence we're aiming for. And here's our values. Here's how we're going to treat each other. Then, then they actually can collaborate. People can collaborate. When tight, things get tight, I know leaders, people more experienced, especially the old gray-haired white guys in the C-suite, we want to control things. Yeah, I know best. I've been around 107 years. I know everything. I'll just fix it. Turns out, if you build your team, whether it's five or 500 or 5,000, if you build your team around a set of principles, agreed on the goals, agreed on the pieces, you don't have to panic. You don't have to change things. 2007 and eight, 2007 and eight, economic downturn fell apart. End of eight, we're, we're in a mess. Nine's in a mess. Do we ever have layoffs? We didn't have layoffs. I never promised the staff we'd never have layoffs, but what I said to him is said, here's the deal. We'll do everything we can. We'll do everything we can. We'll cut here, cut here. Help me. Help me keep our finances somewhere on the rails. And we won't take it out on the frontline staff. And we won't take it on the community by raising prices. We'll take it out on the CEO and the senior leaders who have to go to the board and get beat up by the board for not hitting our financial marks. I said, okay, I'll take a beating. But in the long run, it was better for the organization because flash forward a number of years later, I sit, I, I, in, by 2016, 17, I'm done being the CEO. I write the book. I have a book signing. I had staff coming up, frontline staff, housekeeping, facilities, uh, frontline nurses, billing clerks, IT folks who said, you know what? Jeff, you, you, um, you had our backs in 2008 and nine. We, we, knew, we knew that we, you couldn't promise never to have a layoff, but you didn't have a layoff. A lot of other people did. 
And because of that, we believed you had our backs. And so ever since then, nights, weekends, holidays, when no one's looking, we've had your back. Now, a turkey at Christmas or a little bonus in the check doesn't get that kind of loyalty. That's amazing loyalty. Are they loyal to me? They're loyal to the purpose of the organization. Here's something to remember. If you want to know where, when some leader is transformed, figure out whether they're still stuck in holding people accountable or they are responsible for the well-being of their staff. Holding accountable? Yeah, people ask. I learned that at MBA school. I'm, 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 I hold people accountable. I'm a good manager. Yes. I can get a robot with a clipboard to hold people accountable. You want to build people? You want to be responsible for their success? That, that is a great leader. That builds teams. That serves the purpose. That gets you through tough times because they're responsible for the health and well-being of their staff. Three minutes. All right, perfect. That's exactly how much time I wanted. Um, <laughs> yeah, I never believe an ICU guy. They just make stuff up. Um, here's a flywheel. Here's how it all goes together. If you look at this, a, a serving flywheel says you got to have a clear mission. You have a clear mission. You build a clear culture. You get staff that believe in that. You have disciplined leadership. This is one of the things I'm going to talk to Michael about. I think this is a very important part to his leadership wheel. You have to manage the leaders all the way up and down the organization because a bad leader will have a, a umbrella that's not good. You move finances, facilities, and growth to a toolbox. You don't ignore them, but you move them, you move them to the toolbox. That's, that's what you need, and then you get this virtuous cycle of moving around. We talked about courage. You asked about bravery and courage. Here it is. You want to live those values? Here's what it takes. Courage. Courage to stand up and say, here's what they are. Discipline to stay with them, even when things look ugly, even when it feels like you're going to panic. And durability, because you're going to get beat up along the way. So courage, discipline, and durability. What I really want you to take away is that as a servant leader, you can be as strong, as bold, as innovative, as proactive, and as competitive as anyone else. It's not about being nice. It's about building an amazing team that can serve each other, the organization, and the community. We'll have time for questions. Thanks for your attention. If you have any, uh, any questions that don't get asked, you can always send me an email. Thanks. I do have one question. You really had long hair? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But in those days, it didn't, it didn't haul down because it was all wavy, so it kind of went out. <laughs> kind of like yours does on windy day. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff Thompson, thank you. Our, our second speaker today is Sam Sinta. Um, I've, I've known Sam uh, for approximately the, the last five years. Um, Sam and Rick Kite and I um, and our friend Ben Wedge will have coffee on, at 7 o'clock on Wednesday mornings, uh, something that we all look forward to. Why? Because men are really good at one thing, drinking coffee and telling stories. We are. We, we practice that. It's a little male secret. And in the possibility of telling stories, we developed a friendship. And then when you develop a friendship, you hear people's lives. And Sam Sinta has always been a servant leader. We could talk about his advanced degrees. We can talk about the things that he's accomplished. But he and his wife, Kristen, were looking to raise their daughter in a place other than Denver. And they looked around the country country, and this was our criteria. They wanted to come to a community where they could serve. 
And just before he sold his house in Denver, he wrote, they, they had made an offer on a house in Alaska, and he wrote to the city administrator and said, we'll be moving to Alaska. What can I do to serve in your community? I'm offering my skills and my abilities. He comes to the community. His wife, Kristen, begins to work in home health care, and Sam starts volunteering in the Alaska community and then develops a nonprofit to go into public schools and help children who are having difficulty with learning with their writing and critical thinking skills, mentoring and coaching and bringing other volunteers into the schools, helping young people realize their dreams and possibilities. He teaches at University of Wisconsin lacrosse in uh, political science and with his partnership and friendship with Rick Kite, has developed an online course in civics that when it opened up, it closed within three days because it's full. People are hungry to talk about our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and how do we engage each other in civil conversation. Well, the person who knows how to do this as well as anyone I know is Sam Sinta. Welcome, Sam. Thank you, Tom, for those very kind words. Uh, good morning, everybody. I, I had to try that out because I heard the first two speakers do that, and you all responded. And as someone who teaches at the university, the number of times I walk into the classroom and say, hello, everybody, and I get one student, maybe, in a class of 60 who goes, hey. Uh, so it is just remarkable to just get that uh, call and response. So thank you so much. It is just an honor to be here today to talk with all of you. I'm here to talk uh, with you about my main uh, job, which is b uh, publishing. Uh, I am a book publisher with Fulcrum Publishing. Uh, uh, how many of you love books? Show of hands. Uh, everybody, right? Everybody loves books. We all love books. We all buy books. But so few of us know what really happens within the book industry. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today is the disruption in the publishing industry that we've experienced over the past couple of decades and how a publishing company responded to this disruption. A small company based in uh, Golden, Colorado. I actually have my office here, but we are headquartered out in Golden, Colorado. The nice thing about uh, telecommuting these days is you can live where you want and, and be able to work with staff across the country. So uh, for about 400 years, the publishing industry, the book publishing industry, was a pretty stable industry. Gutenberg invented the movable type. We had books on paper. People were using those books. And it seemed pretty standard. And then the 2000s hit, and a lot of things started happening in the industry that were very opaque to most people who buy books. First of all, uh, Amazon came on the scene. You all are familiar with Amazon. How many of you buy books from Amazon? Okay, you're part of the problem, thank you very much. Uh, but Amazon came on the scene and this changed everything. It changed everything from what books are being published to the pricing of books to the timing of books. Uh, for example, right now when I'm doing new books, I have to let my distributor know uh, that I'm going to be doing new books about 14 months ahead of that book's release. Why? Well, because Barnes & Noble and Amazon demand that information for us because they then have to load that into all of their various systems, which means that my whole time scheme changed. It changed market it changed publicity. It just radically upended the industry, in some ways for good, in some ways that were very challenging. Second of all, the advent of ebooks. Any of you do ebooks, have e readers? Yep. So that comes on the scene. So here we have this pristine, wonderful way of reading for 400 years. It's portable, it can get wet, you don't have to plug it in, right? The book is a perfect technology for the delivery of what it's meant to be. And now we invent ebooks and say, well, guess what? We're going to disrupt that too. And so that creates a whole host of changes in the publishing industry. The distribution process uh, has also changed radically. How books are sold between a publishing house and the end consumer. Time was, when I first got into publishing in the 1990s, that we had our own sales force. We had salespeople that would call on bookstores, that would represent our books, that would be able to talk about our books with book buyers, who would then be able to connect with consumers. So we had that great relationship. 
One of the things that has changed and evolved with some of these other changes that have happened in the last couple of decades is bookstores no longer want to deal with 400 publishers sales forces. Instead, they want to deal with distribution networks, meaning that now I'm represented by a company that also represents about 80 other publishers. Meaning that if I want to understand who my consumer is, that's going to take an extra layer of knowledge on my part, an extra effort on my part to be able to do that. Uh, decline in readership has been a big thing that we also saw over the past couple of decades. The American Association of Publishers, uh, about a decade or so ago, did a survey. This was a wonderful, wonderful survey. They found out that in the prior year that they did the survey, 51% of adult Americans read one book that prior year. Okay? Now that could be anything from a romance novel to a John Grisham thriller to a travel book to a handbook for some other purpose. Most Americans, adult Americans, don't read books. What was interesting is in that same poll they found that while only 51% of Americans had read a book in the prior year, 75% of Americans felt they, quote, had a book in them that they wanted to publish, uh, which is just one of those wonderful statistics. How many of you would love to, you know, you have a story that you want to tell? Yeah, come find me afterwards. I can't tell you if I had a nickel for every time that someone had a book that they had to publish. And then, of course, COVID was a big disruptor, not only for publishing, but for all industries. And we're still feeling the after effects in book publishing. Uh, one of the things that has happened markedly in book publishing over the past year and a half or so is paper prices have increased dramatically. Why? Well, in large part because the paper that is used to produce books derives from the same source that also makes those boxes that everybody now wants shipped to their houses, right? Because everyone is doing online shopping during COVID, meaning that paper prices have skyrocketed. I have seen our paper prices triple in the past year. Uh, which means, of course, much like what uh, Jeff Thompson was talking about, that someone is going to have to pay that price ultimately. And so if you've noticed that your books, your paperbacks at the Barnes & Noble or the Amazon that you go to have increased, a large part of that is because of paper price increase. So it has been a highly disrupted industry over the last couple of decades. And yet, as I stand here today, I am the publisher of a small publishing company, an independent publishing company, that is on the verge of celebrating 40 years of business in two years. We have seen over these past couple of decades a lot of small publishers go out of business, and it has just been an unfortunate trend. The reason that that is highly unfortunate is, as uh, the writer Charles Johnson one no once noted, small publishers are the crucible of American publishing. We are the ones who take chances on unknown or undiscovered authors. We are the ones who are in it for the long run with some of these authors that we build these relationships for some of these people who then go on to become very wealthy, very successful. Uh, without those small publishers, you are going to see bigger disruptions in the long haul in the publishing industry. So the question is, well, how do we do that? How are we able to maintain in the face of all this disruption? And much of like what we've heard already today, the key is people. The reason that I believe that we have been able to be successful is because of the relationships that we have forged. Uh, it's everything from the staff relationships, having a transparency with your staff, emboldening your staff to be willing to try ideas, removing hierarchical uh, uh, lines of operations in your organization, and particularly with a small organization, so that people feel willingness to share ideas, that they feel that they're all part of the same mission. As an example, when we talk about new books or acquiring new books, it is not just me and my editor-in-chief who sit down and talk about that, is what happens in a lot of the big publishing companies. I invite my warehouse manager, my customer service manager, my marketing marketing director, my marketing associate, our interns, they all come to the meeting. Why? Well, because they represent what you represent. They represent different readers, they represent different tastes, they represent different ideas of what might work as a book. And so if I can convince this disparate group of something that we should publish, well then odds are that we're actually going to be able to be successful with that book.
But when we ask the question of who do we serve as an organization, it's not just the staff. It's also looking at those other relationships that we have developed and that we've fostered over the years. And that starts with people like our authors. We, when we publish a book, publish a book for the long term. Books take time. And books are written by one person, ultimately for another person. One of the things that I think a lot of uh, particularly publishing companies uh, fail with is the fact that they believe there's some sort of economy of scale in publishing. There isn't. Ultimately, it is one reader and one author that you're trying to connect. And if you understand that, you are going to invest your time, your energy, and your relationships in those long-term author relationships. Uh, we have been blessed over the years in working with some high-profile people, uh, people like Vine Deloria Jr. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the field of indigenous studies, but Vine Deloria Jr. is perhaps the greatest intellect in Indian country over the last 50 years. We did several of his books. The reason that he worked with us, well, because we listened to him, we paid attention to him, we gave him the attention that he deserved. As a small publishing company, we've worked with three major party presidential candidates on various books with them over the years. Something that you only see generally with the large publishers. Again, why? Well, because we build those relationships. We take time to invest in those relationships. We understand that mission and service come before profit. And it's not like we don't care about profitability in our organization, but every decision that we make in terms of the books we publish always starts with that sense of mission, always starts with that sense of delivering a product to the marketplace that deserves to be in the marketplace, that deserves to be read by some group of people. Now, sometimes that group of people might be 500 people that we know really need this book. Sometimes it might be a potential audience of 5 million people. But the point is trying to understand who that audience is as well, because you're serving that audience also. If you approach publishing with this long-term vision, well, all of a sudden, things make a lot more sense. You're not worried about the immediate return on the book. You're recognizing that you might have a book that takes a year, two, five, ten years to succeed. We have one book called Empty Cradle, Broken Heart. Uh, it was written by a psychiatrist, and it is a uh, collection of stories and interviews with women who have lost their children during pregnancy. When we first signed the book, there was no identifiable market for this book. This was back in the 1980s. We didn't have the, the widespread internet, so we just felt that this was the right book to do. It was an important book to do because it was a story that wasn't being told. Uh, we worked from a grassroots level to try and connect this author with various groups. We got her out on the road to talk with groups. And over time, this book has now become the best-selling book on this topic in the country. We've sold half a million copies of this single book over that time. Why? Well, because we weren't worried about the 12-month return on that project. We believed in that project. Our team believed in that project. And we took a long-range perspective. The same notion of building relationships goes into some of the institutional relationships that we have developed over the years. Probably the, the best one right now that I'd like to share with you is recently we have entered into an arrangement with the Reinhardt Institute to start publishing books on servant leadership. For those of you who follow the servant leadership field, you know that while there are publications out there, there are a lot of holes right now in the servant leadership field. And so starting this year, we are going to be, with the, the help of Rick Kite, who will be working as the series editor on all of these books, releasing about three to four books every year in the field of servant leadership. Now, no, oh, thank you. Yeah. Now, why are we doing that? Well, it's not because of the money, right? It's because we recognize that there is an opportunity here to spread a message that needs to be spread, that needs to go beyond even the people in this audience, that we want to do books that connect to people outside of the servant leadership movement, that we bring people into the movement 
along the way. Now, how are we going to do this? Well, again, we're going to use those same practices that have allowed us to avoid or to overcome some of the disruptions over the past several decades. We're going to invest in relationships. We're going to take a long-term view. We're going to work with people who are smarter than we are and being willing to understand that those people are smarter. They're going to bring ideas to the table that can help us grow that we're going to do things that will fill the marketplace, that will satisfy the marketplace, that will hopefully be profitable, but really that are there to fulfill a sense of mission. And we'll be doing them in ebook formats and audiobook formats and printed book formats as well. When ebooks came out, as I mentioned, that was a huge disruption for a lot of publishers. We embraced it right away. As much as I love the printed book, I recognized at that moment that here is just another way to deliver that same content. And if this is what readers want, we're not going to resist it. We're not going to be purists. We're going to say, okay, we will figure out how to adapt to this. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take extra training for our production people. It's going to take extra training for our customer service people to be able to deliver that. But it's worth it because, again, who do we serve? The author? the customer, and our people. As much as I love for our books to do well at Amazon and Barnes and Noble, they're not at the front of my purview when I'm publishing books. Those three constituencies are the author, the audience, the consumer, and our people. And if we keep that in focus all the time, if we can develop the loyalty among all of those groups, well, we can't help but be successful in the process. We can't help but overcome some of the challenges that do face us. So, uh, publishing in its best years is a marginal business. Uh, anywhere from 3 to 4% gross profit is not uh, unusual. When you start throwing disruption into this, when you start throwing things like increased paper prices, you find that you know, you're tightening those margins even more. But at the end of the day, how do you survive? By keeping the customer, the author, and those relationships front and center. That's what we've done and that's what we will continue to do, uh, as I think has been echoed throughout uh, all of the talks here. Within that, we'll innovate. We will try to be creative. Uh, dirty little secret right now, I won't go into the gory details, but Amazon makes more money on our books when they sell them than we do. Now, let that sink in. When Amazon, who is merely a distributor of books, makes more money per sale of our books than we, the publisher, or the author who is the creator, make on every sale of those books. Okay? So, it's a reality. I'm not going to change that, but what can I do? I can understand the fundamentals of the relationship building that make up this business, and I can find innovative ways to connect directly to customers so that they don't feel the need to buy to Amazon, so that they can actually get a better deal ordering a book from me than they can from Amazon. And when they do that, guess what? The customer gets a better deal, the author gets a higher royalty, and we make more money. All of that just based simply on good relationships, honest relationships, transparent relationships, and understanding that these things take time. Right? So, what seems like impossible challenges, I'm not worried about those. I don't fret with those. Tom mentioned some of the work I've done in schools. Education is also in disruption. I'm sure there are some educators out here. Again, you don't tack away, you tack to. You build on what has gotten you to that point, you build on that innovation, and you build on those relationships. At the end of the day, it is all about the humans that we work with and the humans that we connect with. All of that, again, starts with our team. Uh, we would not be where we are without our team. Our team is front and center of everything that we do. In fact, we were just talking yesterday, we're going to try something new that I don't think any publisher has done before. N starting next year, we're gonna have a welcome letter at the front of every one of our books. And that welcome letter will explain to the reader why we published this book, 
We'll talk about why we signed this book, what this author means to us, and why we think you, the reader, will appreciate this book. Now, I've seen similar letters in the past that have been done in what's called galleys, advanced copies of books, and they're always signed by one of two people, the publisher or the editor. These letters that we're gonna be doing in our books are gonna be signed by the Fulcrum team because all of us contribute to the success of that product. No one person means any more to anybody else or to anything else in terms of the success of that project. So uh, I hope uh, to, uh, I will be out in the lobby uh, for the next couple days. If any of you are interested in hearing more about the new publishing series that we are doing, if any of you are interested in writing uh, for the series, we'd love to talk with you as well. Uh, but please have a great conference and thanks again for having me this morning. <clears throat>
it shifted once I started to read and really endorse the, the curriculum of the servant leadership principle. I realized immediately that I needed to start leaving with more intent. Um, I needed to start being a leader in every capacity that I took. Mariah, who sprinkles those seeds, who nurtures and feeds those seeds of servant leadership, your servant heart now? Um, definitely. My grandmother um, started that, but my mother um, is also just probably the kindest heart I know. Um, and I say that, I say kindest heart, um, I, I think that people are their hearts, right? When I see people, when I meet people, I want to know their work, but their work is their heart. Like their work is what they're doing in the community and how they're spreading what, what a heart is, love, right? So I genuinely meet people um, and it, there's new people that I meet every day and I want to know their work, I want to know their hearts. And so I would say Sprinkle um, would come from the intent of listening. So now um, every person is a sprinkle that I meet each and every day. Every person who speaks, I meet people intently. And it's funny because my friends always will say, here goes Mariah talking to someone new. And literally, we will go anywhere. I mean, I'll be at the restaurant. I'll be, um, there'll be a, a server, a waitress, anyone. Everyone has value. Everyone has heart in the work that they do. And so everyone is genuinely a sprinkle to me. How did your time at the Place of Grace shape you in looking at the hearts, oftentimes mm -hmm. broken hearts of others, and your response as a servant and as a leader? You know, I never told this story publicly, and um, I knew it would be a time that I would need to share this story. So I actually thought that I would be queuing a in next to the police, the chief of police of, of La Crosse, um, but unfortunately he's out sick. Um, so Sam took his place. But um, it's ironic, when I, when I lived, here in La Crosse, um, it was pretty traumatic for me. Um, I went through a really traumatic experience um, where I was committed, or I was convicted of a DUI, right? And I was convicted of that in August, um, prior to, or in May, and I had to start at the Place of Grace in August, right? And I don't even think my culture of a turbo who's here knows that. Um, no one knew that. But the people that I serve are unfortunately the most vulnerable population who unfortunately has to numb out their pain. And so what do they do? They use, right? What do they do? Um, they hurt each other, right? Because a lot of times we don't know how to, one, speak about, articulate our pain, but also try to work together to heal ourselves. So I think starting at the place of grace is when I realized that I was no better than anyone that would walk through that door because I also made my own mistakes. And I also went through my own trauma that I wasn't willing to stare in the face of until God hit me with the best, the best tragedy of my life, where I realized that no one ever, everyone experiences pain, and no one ever in this world is walking around hurting, or is walking around not hurting. Every person has gone through something that has changed their lives forever, and it's whether you want to deal with that or you want to run from it. And so Place of Grace taught me with each person I walked through the door that many of those people decided to run. That or and or live within a society of systematic racism who never knew what it was to be provided for and have unfortunately had people run from them, had resources run from them. And so I serve them with that integrity each and every day. That's beautiful. Mariah, in your current role, you help nurture the souls, the hearts, the spirits of some of those who are hurting the most in our communities mm -hmm. and in the Milwaukee area. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the things that might go on during your day? What are some of the daily tasks that you're doing to help serve your community? Absolutely. Um, one is the privilege to do what I do, is the privilege to sit in front of anyone. And I work as an individual, uh, individualized counselor, but then I also work in the group setting, um, rendering group therapy at Guest House as well for a um, substance abuse program for serving males um, in the Milwaukee community. So I'm either running a group and or I'm, uh, I have about now 18 clients, so I'm ripping and running throughout the Milwaukee area because I come to them. Um, and all of them coming from all walks of life, women, men, all of, some being double my age, some being my age, um, no one being younger than me. 
Uh, and that was huge at first for me to swallow, like, what do I have to say to these people? But I started to realize that my tragedies, my trauma, spelled out my wisdom. And that's why I started to realize that people listened to me. They wanted my service. And then that's why wait lists and things like that have been created since then within my service. And it's become pretty popular in the Milwaukee area, um, which I don't talk about much at all, right? Um, but I would say with what I do, faith, um, my service is, obviously, it says the spiritual care specialist. Um, and I didn't really understand uh, really, I would say, disseminate how faith changed my life until I started doing what I was doing um, and been doing for two years. I realized once I was teaching other people the importance of faith that it made me understand its importance. It was the same thing as when I now have coached basketball um, at my alma mater in Brown Deer. Same thing. I didn't understand what the, uh, the, the challenge of a, being a coach was until I started to try to teach basketball to young girls who didn't want to listen to a word I had to say, <laughs> right? Um, so both went the same way, but teaching faith taught me the importance and teaching basketball taught me the importance of needing a coach and a role model. So I would say faith um, and really learning what that was um, through my clients has really kind of resonated with both and all the people that I serve, um, just the importance of it in society. Um, Mariah, you embrace the moral imperative of servant leadership that Robert Greenleaf talked about. How are the least privileged being served? Um, how has this transformed your life? in identifying with the least privileged. Right now in La Crosse, we have about 140 people living in Huska Park. Mm -hmm. And it really hurts me as people talk about those people. Yep. Or what we just saw happening in San Antonio, 51 people dying uh, in a, in a in brought in transit mm -hmm. and don't even have a name. Mm -hmm. Um, how is it that you help people rediscover their humanity in the midst of all this? I would say interconnectedness is the most important word we all need to endorse as a society. Interconnectedness. When we detach ourselves from thinking that other people mean anything to us at all, that's when we divide as a country and that's when polarity is created. We literally live in a polar community by choice. This is not by design. Well, some might argue, but by choice, um, we live in a polar society and the reason is for or the reason is because of many ignoring interconnectedness in this importance what does it mean and why is it a word right we uh michael talked about words earlier and how words don't mean anything unless it means something to you right like unless you actually embody the word you know it's just your actions but interconnectedness what that word really is saying is a common love we all have to come to a sense of loving each other. And I know a lot of people are probably like, that's BS. I have to take care of my family. I have to do this. I have to do that. And that's the problem, I think, with the world right now, if you were to ask me. It's the fact that we don't think that every person deserves the privilege of being loved, first and foremost. And the biggest thing, one of the things was that they weren't eating on those who passed away. Unfortunately, the 50 people who passed, they weren't eating. Who knows where, where, whether they were drinking, like, just survival um, needs every, that, that we all have uh, need to be met by every person, but we have to all care about that. Each and every one of us has to care about that, depend, uh, regardless of what we look like, how much money we have, um, what we've done in the past, right? Transgressions. We can't let that hold us from loving everyone, and that's true interconnectedness. So Mariah, I know that your health is important to you, having a good mind, a good heart, a good spirit, um, and the things that you put in your body and do with your body are important. Can you talk a little bit about that, about um, how you like to eat and what you like to do? Because I think that is part of your kind of um, whole, whole person as a servant. I get what you're getting at. <laughs> um, me and Regina actually met um, 
met when I graduated uh, Viterbo, and I just, I did leave you. <laughs> I went back to Milwaukee, went home. Um, my family was happy. Um, but um, when I met her, I just thought that she was just, and she still is, um, just this pivotal uh, figure in the lacrosse community. And so you guys are really privileged to have her. Um, but a story I told her was we were trying to figure out where to go eat. I said, well, okay, the thing is I'm vegan, right? And she, you know, many people get, you know, flabbergasted when I say I'm vegan. They're like, well, what does that mean? Like, what do we need to do? And I'm like, it's going to be okay. Like, I can, at the end of the day, I'll find a salad, you know, or they, they all have fruit and they all have water. Like, I'll be fine, right? But many people get very uncomfortable when I say I'm vegan, which is why I don't say it often, right? But um, that all happened also when I was in lacrosse, so much transformation in lacrosse. Um, I got diagnosed, and um, my coach, Bobby, remembers this. I got diagnosed in 2016. So when I, I graduated from my um, school in Indianapolis with my bachelor's in psychology, and I also had, um, at that time, I had just been recovering from hip surgery. So I tore my labrum and my hip, and I was actually playing on it, which if anyone knows, that's like ridiculous, but I was playing on it. I wanted to play my last year. I was devastated. And so I had to just succumb to being injured and being out the entire season. And that's why I didn't want to end my career like I did. So I, went to, I came to Viterbo. They gave me the opportunity. But the first thing I remember, one of the first things I remember telling Bobby, my coach, was, hey, so I'm doing this pescatarian thing. So like, I just need you to be OK with that, OK? Or no, at first, I think I, no, I ended up telling her that I want to be vegan first. And she said, can we just like meet in the middle at pescatarian? <laughs> And I was like, you know what? I think I probably should, like, because I always try to jump. So I was like, maybe I should jump just a little, a little bit before I like really reach the top. So that's where it started. Um, I because during that time, the reason why they ended up finding that my hip, I tore my labrum, or I had a stress fracture in my hip twice, and I tore my labrum the second time. And the doctor ended up saying it was because I was basically malnourished because I had hypothyroidism, and I didn't know. And so I got, um, I got a prescription for a medication that they said that I needed to take for the rest of my life. And I just thought that that was like the worst news I had ever heard in my life. Like, I was like, this is it. Like, mom, like, and they almost promised that I would probably need thyroid surgery. So I just thought it was, it was over. And I remember once taking the medication, I remember just saying to myself, okay, I'm going to figure a way out of this. And then so it was veganism that I researched over and over and over during my undergrad that I realized that was what I was going to choose. That was a course because it was worth a try if they already gave me, <laughs> you know, a terminal sentence. Right. And so that's what happened um, over the course of uh, my time in, in lacrosse. Uh, so 2017, August of 2017 is when I became vegan. So I started in 2016 and it took me about a year to become vegan, do that transition. Um, and I weaned myself off my medication, anti um, Western medicine, my doctor hated it, but whatever. Um, I got my work, uh, my blood work done over and over and over because she didn't believe it. And my levels have been leveled for about five years now. So, um, yep, I've been a vegan since 2017, August. And, um, but as far as taking care of yourself, I took ownership of my health in the moment. You know, I said, is there any other way to live a better life without being dependent on medication? Is there any other way? That was it. Like many times we just need to ask, is there any other way? And a lot of times we don't want to sacrifice things that we love for that. Like what, what could I do different other than take this medication to feel better? And so I, if I'm connecting it, the two together, we need to do that in society as well with everything and so on and so forth. But I'm in, I'm, like I said, I became intentional because of servant leadership. So it, it also included my body. Um, and so being vegan has really, really helped me, but also it, helped, it has helped my family and my friends. Everyone to this extent around me eats healthier um, because of me, you know, and it's just, it just was a commitment for myself. So we need to all really think about the sacrifices we're making because it's not just for us, it's for everyone around us as well. So wise, yet so young. Uh, at this point, we're going to call out our other two panelists and give a chance again for questions. Regina, thank you. Why don't you stay here? You, you, you asked such wonderful questions. So uh, Sam, and you can come over and join the mic with me here. So Sam, Jeff, 
Have a seat. There's a stool there. Huh? All right, a, que a question from the audience for, our, for any of our speakers. Jeff from Gunderson, Sam Fulcrum, Mariah, working on the fringes of our communities. Question is to each, how do you sustain yourself in leadership? You just spoke. She says, <laughs> oh, I just spoke. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, um, well, I'm, I'm going to uh, take off on Mariah, and I think uh, part of it's self-discipline, uh, to say that the role of the world is not to take care of me, um, my job is to take care of the world, and so I, I have to take, and part of that's me, and so um, eating a healthy diet, um, getting your exercise, really boring stuff, right? Um, so you, you eat well, you exercise well. You, um, I think uh, one of the ways to sustain yourself is to understand that it doesn't matter how many degrees you have, how much experience you have, there's so much to learn out there. And you know, some, I don't know where this phrase comes from, it's kind of cliche-ish, but you know, as a leader, if, if you're more of a learn-it-all than a know-it-all, you, you will sustain yourself better because you can find people to teach you from the front row, from the middle row, from different organizations, people that look different, talk different, have different backgrounds. That, that sustains you by not talking to the same people about the same stuff, but taking care of yourself and then broadening your horizons. Yeah, and uh, echoing on uh, a little bit, building on that and, and echoing a little bit of what Michael was talking about this morning, being willing to be wrong or being willing to make mistakes, right? And, and accepting that and understanding that you don't have all of the information and, and you're open to learning to new experiences every day, I think is, is critical for that. Yeah, yeah, I heard somebody say the other day that you, gotta, you don't get better unless you make mistakes. And I don't think that's true. I think... I think you get better by making mistakes and then learning from them. <laughs> yep. uh, there's a lot of people that make mistakes. And yeah. just make mistakes. Just keep making mistakes. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. They just, they it's don't that learn learning part that's key. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would say balance, too. You have to find the balance of taking care of yourself. It has to be the same amount. Like, I can't put in so much to my client and then go home and do nothing for me. It has to, it has to be equal. Um, making sure you're taking care of yourself, just as you want your clients to take care of themselves. Yeah. I have a question. Good. So we're talking about disruptions in this session, and um, there are many disruptions in our world right now and in our country right now. What would be your thoughts on uh, a step that we can take here, a tangible step, to help heal our community or heal our world? Take, take empathy seriously. Uh, as again was discussed this morning, listen to people. And uh, when, when I talk with young people about critical thinking, when we think about critical thinking, we tend to think of it as what I would call the, the vertical, right? The deep thinking. But critical thinking also is horizontal. It means opening yourself up to new ideas and new experiences and being willing to maybe be wrong or to learn from somebody else, to acknowledge. We're missing so much of that in our public discourse today, and this is why we can't be civil, because everybody goes into pretty much every political conversation convinced they have all the information and they're correct. And odds are you're not, uh, but you can learn from someone, you can listen from someone, and, and by doing that, we can actually build some bridges in our society if we take that seriously. I, I think there's very few problems that we have that are single sector problems. Um, healthcare, after being pretty much comatose for 50 years um, or 100, is finally wake up saying, gee, some patients are sick because of things outside the walls of the hospital mm -hmm. or the clinic. Mm -hmm. What an amazing thing. <laughs> who, who knew that being starved or uneducated or not having immunizations, not having um, adequate transportation, food, or opportunities could make you ill? What an amazing thought. Maybe we should do something about this. So, so I think almost n none of the solutions are single sector. And that's why 
you go back to the original discussion of the day about purpose, what do we want for our communities, and then who's going to contribute to that? Whose voices? Mm -hmm. Broad and deep voices. Whose abilities? Broad and deep abilities from different parts. That's how you solve problems long term, not for the next monthly financial report, mm -hmm. but long term for the good of your group, your organization, or the community. Mm -hmm. So it's breadth and depth beyond your walls, and that'll make you a stronger company, a stronger educational organization, uh, or whatever you're working in. Yeah. Um, I always say uh, change doesn't come without disruption. Right? Change doesn't come without chaos. So I would say it needs to be us embracing disruption. Um, more came after, say, the racial uproar. More came after COVID. We started caring about the lives of others more. Um, embracing the change that came after disruption and not just seeing it as it was this horrible, horrifying thing. How do we change as people after it? Embracing that and then pushing that and not just allowing that to be one thing that happened and then a year later go back to where we were. No, endorse the change because it, it happened for a reason. It's good. Yeah, good. Please, la lady, right hand up point. This question is for Ms. Blair. Uh, how do you maintain that balance, uh, uh, maintain the balance in your life after giving so much work? How do you question is, how do you maintain balance after giving so much away? Nice. That's, a, that's a hard question. <laughs> and I, I can promise you, I'm not great at it. Um, or I wasn't great at it. But it, it wasn't until I started being accountable for my own mental health, right? So if I'm a, you should always take in the things that you expect others to take from you, right? So if I'm, if I'm a counselor, I needed therapy myself then. You know, um, if whatever it was that I was giving away, I also needed to take back. So if I go to, if I'm speaking, then I also need to be reading content, you know? Um, so I would say, uh, how do I lift up? How do I lift myself up? I always am evaluating myself. I'm being honest with myself. I'm journaling. I would tell everyone to get a journal. I'm journaling. I'm praying, I'm, I'm figuring out what is it that I need in my life right now. I'm always asking myself, what do I need? And then I go about finding those things for myself. So always evaluating self. You're welcome. Please, last question. I have a question for Sam about publishing and about self-publishing. Has it been a disruptor for your business? Has it given you opportunities or challenges the question is, publishing and self-publishing, how has that contributed to disruption and opportunities? So um, when I first got into the business, self-publishing was there, but it was incredibly expensive. Uh, people had to pay thousands of dollars and would end up with a garage full of books, basically, uh, which no one wanted to. And, and Amazon, of all players, uh, and Barnes and Noble to an extent actually really radically changed all of that. So that now the self-publishing uh, availability is for anybody. Uh, you can pay very little. You still should pay to get your book edited if you're going to self-publish a uh, good edited book. And, and it also probably pays to get somebody to help with layout. Uh, but the, the, the barrier to entry is much lower. Um, I don't see that for us as a, 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 a disruption simply because uh, it kind of goes back to the thing I said earlier about how so many people have a book that they want to get out there, but not everybody has a book that fits for a traditional publishing house. And so to me, the, 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 the point that there are more avenues for voices to get out there is actually wonderful. I think that that is tremendous. Uh, because the more voices that we have out there, the more people can actually connect with those voices. Many of the self-published books, I think the average self-published book sells about 40 copies a year. So they, they're not real big sellers, but for the person who writes them, and for those 40 people who buy them, they are very, very important books. So that doesn't work in the model of traditional publishing, but, but great that there is a path for that 
that exists today. I actually think it's quite wonderful. Now, I think bigger publishers and other publishers see it maybe as a disruption because it clutters the marketplace or maybe as an opportunity because sometimes you can pluck some of these particularly fan fiction novels and, and build that into a great new brand as, as has happened with some, some, some books over the years. But no, I think the more voices we have, the more democratic process we have for publishing, we're a better country for that. So, so I'm, I'm happy to see that there are platforms for that existing today. Well, we're going to have to leave it, that, leave it there. I want to thank uh, Regina Siegel, Vice President at Trustpoint, for coming up and leading our discussion. <laughs> the next time you pick up a book, please think of Sam. <laughs> the, next time, the next time your family needs health care, Please think of Jeff. The next time you see one of our brothers and sisters with hard traveling, please think of Mariah. Thank you all so very much. And now, just before lunch, Kathy Smalley is going to lead us in a, a, a short engagement exercise. Kathy? Here you go, you bet. Good morning, everybody. How great has this morning been? Yeah? Well, I'm an introvert, so I always have to take time to process. I'm sure many of you are as well. So before we break to lunch, I'm going to ask us to take a few moments. Um, I'll start out with a story for you, and then we'll have a chance to share with each other before we break for lunch. So let me set the stage for this, this story. There's a woman that walks every single morning. God bless her, I don't have that kind of discipline. But she goes out right around dawn every morning, walks. So this was a few months, well, more than a few months ago, right at the beginning of fall. So picture in your mind, you know, the days are getting shorter, the leaves are falling off the trees, right? And she's doing her walk. Well, the weather's so nice, she's actually walked a little further than she usually does. She's trudging up a hill. The first lights of the day are coming through. And she sees a silver maple tree that she's seen many, many times before. But that day, that light hits that maple tree. And for a moment, it looks like is it the light coming through the tree? Or is it angels dancing on the wings, on their wings in that tree? And she stops in awe, right? And she's like, this is really neat. There's a tree full of angels. And she takes it in. Picture it. Now, if she was a kid, what would she do? She'd be running home and saying, Mom, I saw a tree full of angels. And every one of her friends, she'd be running around telling them that. But she's an adult, so what does she do? She's like us. She's not going to tell one person that she saw a tree full of angels this morning on her walk, is she? <laughs> Keep that in mind as we continue along here. So the... Robert Greenleaf, as you all know, is the, the father of servant leadership. And in his seminal work, The Servant as Leader, he says the following. Awareness is not a giver of solace. It's just the opposite. It's a disturber and an awakener. Able leaders are usually sharply aware and reasonably disturbed. They are not seekers after solace. They have their own inner serenity. Inner serenity is not something that leaders are born with. It's something that they have to work at. Inner serenity takes time. It takes silence. It takes contemplation. And I am more than ever convinced that because of the disruptions in the last few years, we as leaders have to spend more time in silence and contemplation 
so that we can continue to develop that inner serenity. Now, as a leader, if all you do is contemplate and think, but don't go anywhere with that, you're not going to get very far either. You need a trusted mentor, a spiritual advisor, whatever you would like to call them, even just a good friend, that you can bounce those ideas off of. I encourage you to do that as well. So the story that I took is in a book. It's actually called A Tree Full of Angels. And it's written by a Benedictine sister, Macrina, Macrena Weider, I'm going to, Weiderker. I'm going to butcher her name, even though I've said it to myself many, many times. But in this book, she also has a poem. Is there a lost child in you? What pains me most these days is my inability to reach back into my years and touch the child that I was. And yet, loving, living, stirring deep within my soul, that child lives on. There are days when my adult ways turn tasteless in my mouth and the child of long ago starts pressing on my soul. On days like that, I long to touch that child again and let her take me by the hand and lead me down a path that has a heart and show me all the things that I've stopped seeing because I've grown too tall. I invite you to spend a minute or two and think about things that you no longer see because you've grown too tall. I invite you to share what you've thought about with someone near to you. Take a few moments, share what you've what you thought about. <laughs> Thank you. If we, if you guys are like anything like me, I can talk myself into doing all the self-care that I want, and I can read and contemplate. But if I don't make a promise to myself, if I don't use an I will statement, I will probably not do it next week or the week after. So I encourage you to repeat after me. I... State your name. <laughs> Not state your name. Come on. I, Kathy Smalley, I promise that over the next 30 days, I will pick one thing that you would like to do for self care. I will walk every day. What's what it come? So that I become a better servant leader and take care of myself. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy is a leader and trainer at Optum.